empezar en nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Pedimos al Señor que mande su Espíritu Santo para que nos guíe, nos abre nuestras mentes, siempre a su divina voluntad. Gloria al Padre, al Hijo y al Espíritu Santo, como era el principio, ahora y siempre, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. En nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. And so, uh, we're going to uh, present tonight a little bit about uh, an upcoming uh, event that uh, might be very much interest to us, especially if you're following uh, ecclesial, uh, what they call, uh, yeah, ecclesial, I don't want to say politics, but yeah, ecclesial politics and current events. There's a synod that's going to be coming up in October, so not too far away from now. Um, and it's uh, generated a little bit of uh, controversy, some discussion as well. So I think before it occurs in uh, October, we get a little bit of uh, introduction of what's going on so that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, better appreciate what, uh, what will come out of it and what's been uh, talked about in the upcoming Synod for the Amazon. And so um, I'm going to talk about what has been presented so far. There's a document that's a working document that the Synod Fathers are going to be examining. They've already examined and uh, they will be discussing in the coming weeks. And so uh, I'll give you a summary of what that document has and some of the themes and some of the debates that are actually coming out from that document. It's a process that started already one year ago. And so uh, we're at the end of basically uh, one year of, the, of having announced the Synod and uh, now coming to uh, kind of its uh, execution. And so first of all, we, the word comes up a lot, Synod. What exactly is a Synod? So let's take a look first at what the word synod means. And synod, like any ecclesial terminology, tends to come, not from Latin, from Greek. And so this is a Greek word, synodos, or synodos, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce the word. It's a Greek word. Sun, which means with, con, something together. And hodos, which means road. So if you have an odometer, O-D-O, -O, that's what is measuring how long you've been on the road. And so sunodos literally means together or with on a road or putting together in a road. It also means reunion or assembly. That's the way it was used in Greek as well. So if you look up in a dictionary, sunodos literally means a gathering, uh, a, bringing, a coming together. And so a synod is essentially a coming together And so it's an assembly of the local church, normally, presided under the bishop, who is the head of the church, to discuss or to solve a problem or a question, an issue. And so the synod in itself is a local matter. It's a local, uh, has a local scope. And so the, the Archdiocese of Miami, I think maybe four years ago, celebrated a synod here. And uh, different dioceses can celebrate their own synods. One of the most famous synods have been the Synod of Rome. The Roman Synod historically uh, uh, was uh, the most important because it kind of had a universal or uh, a more international aspect to it. But uh, synods are, are celebrated regularly. It's a part of the church has been in the history of church since time immemorial. Uh, the concept of synod or a coming together of the church, the leaders of the church to hammer out a question or to come to a resolution to a problem. Paul VI, and so the, the modern synod, our synod today, actually has its roots in Vatican II with Paul VI. Paul VI institutes what's called the Permanent Synod of Bishops. So this is a new kind of genesis or evolution of synod or the synodal church in this thing they're called it's, it's specifically the Synod of Bishops. It goes back to 1965. And the reason why the Synod of Bishops was formed, so a gathering of bishops, was to further the stipulations that were found in the conciliar document Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium presents the church to the 20th century. Uh, it's the document, you can say the constitution, it is called the dogmatic constitution, that kind of defines and presents the church into modernity. And so, what is the face of church in modern times? What can we say of the church in the modern times? Look at Lumen Gentium, and it's there. One of the things that Lumen Gentium calls for, and in this pre presentation of the church in modern times, is this thing that we call collegiality. Collegiality, collegiality amongst bishops and the pope. Collegiality, actually, that one comes from a Latin word, collegium. 
we know what a colegio is. It's kind of the same thing. What is a colegio? Well, it's a place where you gather also together. You get together and you also hammer out or you learn something or you come to some, uh, uh, some conclusion. In Roman times, colleges were actually places where people had a common, kind of a common occupation or a common theme. La agrupación would have been considered in ancient Rome, un colegio, the college of the university students, for example. And still today in Rome, the, the, uh, the Jesuit house for those Jesuits and studies is called the college. The college is where you live, the university is where you study. And so this idea of being together, of convivencia, is uh, one of the themes that came out of Lumen Gentium, uh, especially with that relationship, one amongst bishops, and then the bishops with the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Before Vatican II, the, 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 the relationship was a little bit different. It was, uh, it was more regimented in a certain way, and uh, the idea of collegiality or coming together or kind of that, uh, that uh, collaboration almost on, this, on, the, on the level of equals really wasn't there. It was almost like the Pope was the manager, the bishops were the, the, the regional managers, and well, get to work, and then we turn back and look to the Pope, what he needs, and we'll carry it out in, in, in the diocese. Lumen Gentium kind of wants to break that mold and say, no, we're all together in this, and so promotes that collegiality between bishops and the Bishop of Rome, and so the Bishop of Rome is not just seen anymore as like a, a general manager, but uh, all the other bishops are seen together uh, in, a, in, a, in an equal light. Of course, the Pope being, uh, being uh, a little bit, uh, uh, having a, f a first place amongst them. The idea was for bishops to have a greater role in the universal governance of the church. So not just their diocese, but to have a say and to have a participation in what is the, co the government of the church throughout the whole world. Because again, it seemed to be anything that dealt with the old church, the universal church, well, that was Rome. And then, well, the bishop in his own diocese kind of just worried about his own territory and really the view didn't go beyond there. And so part of that of Lumen Gentium was to bring all bishops, regardless of rank and regardless of where they're from, to have a participation in that universal governance, which is headed by the pope, and uh, to aid him in that governance. And so bring them together, and bring them together where? In Rome, to help the pope. Uh, and also the idea was to get an involvement of bishops from all around the world. Historically, well, the bishops in Rome, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the different bishops that would be in the Roman Curia, for example, well, well because by their, by their uh, occupation and where they are, they tend to be the most involved. And so if you were a bishop in Rome, well, you probably had more of a voice than one that was far away and never got to Rome. And so the idea was to start bringing bishops from all around the world and that way we can address problems from around the world through the people that were actually there. And so that was another kind of objective of the Synod of Bishops, bring bishops together. The world's a big place and not every bishop knows each other. And so unless you're going to, the, uh, to a council, you're probably not gonna have an opportunity as a bishop to meet bishops from all around the world unless you have the meeting. So the Synod of Bishops, the irregular recurring Synod of Bishops is also an opportunity for bishops from around the world to get to know each other. The intent was to continue that conciliar spirit that was in Vatican II and put it into the regular governance of the church. The event of Vatican II had really uh, impacted the members, Paul VI being one of them before being Pope, he was also one of the uh, conciliar fathers. And so being that Paul VI was the one who actually concluded and carried out most of the council, he was very affected by that, uh, that spirit of what was going on in Vatican II. And so, he wanted to institutionalize it, put it into the regular governance of the church and uh, so that it can address uh, the uh, questions of the time and apply the, 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 the process, apply the, uh, pretty much the, uh, the, 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 the process of the council uh, in perpetuity almost. So it's not just something isolated in the 60s, but that it keeps on going into, into pre, uh, modern times. And it has since 1965, been brought together on a regular basis to discuss different issues from around the world or issues that, uh, that, uh, that are generally to Rome uh, or uh, more localized issues as the one that we're gonna be celebrating pretty soon. And so the Synod of Bishops also has a definition, a legal definition. And so for those who are interested in law in here, go to the Code of Canon Law and you look at Canon 342 
Right there, it tells us. The Synod of Bishops is a group of bishops who have been chosen from different regions of the world, meet together at fixed times to foster closer unity between the Roman pontiff and themselves and other bishops, and assist the Roman pontiff with their counsel in preservation and growth of the faith and morals and in observance of a strengthening of ecclesiastical di discipline and to consider questions pertaining to the activity of the church in the world. So it's a great deliberative body, it's a great consultative body. And so that's its main focus, is to be a group of consultors in a certain way that, that regularly gets together. Next canon after that, 343. It's for the Synod of Bishops to discuss the questions for consideration and express wishes, but not to resolve them or issue decrees about them unless in certain cases, the Roman pontiff has endowed it with deliberative power, in which case he ratifies the decisions of the synod. And so in the history of the, 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 uh, the synod of bishops, you've had both. It's almost been half and half, uh, depending on, on the pope and depending on what the, uh, the, the different uh, subject is. Sometimes they're just there to bounce back an idea, to deliberate. Other times they have been given uh, this uh, 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 task to come up with a resolution for something. So an example, uh, under Pope Benedict the, uh, the, uh, XVI, there was a special synod on the new evangelization, for example. And so that was kind of deliberate in how to evangelize in the world, but really nothing, no decree or no kind of normative rules or law came out of that. It was kind of just kind of discussed on how evangelization has been going on. Um, but uh, before that, there was another synod, though, on priestly life and all that. And yes, rules did come, did come out of that one. And so you've got kind of both and both, uh, both of the types going on at the same time. This synod uh, right now has uh, been actually endowed with that deliberative power to uh, consider certain questions and present possible, uh, possible solutions. Now, as you see, the pope either ratifies the decisions of the synod or he doesn't. And so that's, uh, at, at the end of the day, the synod is just a deliberative body. It just presents a suggestion. But the Pope is not obliged to follow the decisions of the synod. No, it's still purely consultative at the end. The next canon, 344, the synod of bishops is directly subject to the authority of the Roman pontiff. So it keeps, us, keeps it very clear. The Pope is the boss in this one. Again, he's consulting his, uh, his bishops, but he does not let go of his authority at any moment. And so he convokes a synod as often as he seems it opportune and designates a place where the sessions ought to be held. That means it doesn't have to be in Rome. It could be anywhere else in the world. Uh, in modern times, it's been in Rome. But if you go to medieval times where I study, it's been all around Europe. They've had synods in Paris. They've had synods in Marseille. They've had some synods in, even in Spain. And so it's not necessarily in Rome. And as often as he wants to uh, convoke it. And so just recently, uh, maybe four years ago, I think it was, there was the extraordinary synod on the family. And so right there, that was when he just convoked on his own. He didn't, he didn't wait for the regular. It's normally every two or four, uh, three years that they convoke a synod. He decided to make it right away. So the Pope can go ahead and call whenever he wants. He re uh, the synod regulates the election of members. Oh, I'm sorry, the Pope regulates the election of members who have to be elected according to the norm of special law and designates and appoints other members. In other words, well, the Pope is the one who names who goes to the, bishop, to the synod. He invites the, the, the bishops. And every synod has different rules. There's no fixed rules for synods. Right there is saying the special law is in place. Basically, the Pope makes it up every single time he convokes the, the synod. So it's not a set way of electing members or selecting people. It's at the Pope's, uh, at the Pope's pleasure. He determines, the Pope determines the appropriate time before the celebration of a synod and the contents or questions to be treated according to the norm of special law. Again, he kind of creates the whole thing out of, uh, on his own, what they call motu proprio, on his own will. He defines the agenda and he, present, he presides at the synod personally or he can delegate that to someone else. Pope Francis has been famously presiding uh, the, the synods. Pope uh, uh, Benedict and even Pope John Paul II, every now and then they would have someone stand in their place, especially when their health was already uh, de uh, deteriorating. And the Pope also concludes, transfers, suspends, or dissolves the synod at his pleasure as well. 
There are other canons after that would just pertain to what members, there's a secretary, there's a subsecretary, what happens if someone has to be substituted, so we can, we can skip that. But here is the legal definition or the legal scope of what a synod does right there in the Code of Canon Law. Yes? Uh, yeah, unless he, yeah, he just uh, wants uh, to bounce a reaction, wants them to pray over something, yeah. And so it's, it, it, it says unless, yeah, he gives it to them. Now, like I said, in, at least in Pope Francis's case, he's given that power to, each, to every synod he's convoked. So I think to the three, yeah, he's convoked three so far. And he's given that to each one of them. Um, but like I said, it's not a fixed rule either. Yep. Uh, not necessarily. There was a close uh, call with uh, Pope Paul VI and with the Humana Vitae thing. And so th it was, th he wanted to actually call a synod on that, but when he got the, when he kind of saw where it would go and the possibility that he might have to do it, he said, you know what, better just don't call it at all, and they let that stay the way it was. But that was, that was, that, was, that, that might have been a, a case. But in recent memory, not in modern memory. I'm thinking 1800s, yes, but uh, not, in, not in modern memory. And so how is the uh, synod organized? So as I said, the pope legislates the order for every single synod. He makes it up you know, almost as every single time. And so the document that will go that establishes this synod is called Episcopalis Communio. For pope Francis is the author in 2018, so just last year. He organized the Synod of Bishops along the same lines as a church council. This is very interesting because he's taking the structure of Vatican II and applying it kind of in a micro case uh, with the Synod of Bishops. And so he finds that the Synod of Bishops, in this case, and it could be from now on unless he doesn't legislate anything new, consists of three phases. The first phase is called the preparatory phase. And in that preparatory phase, it's the, the, we consult the faithful regarding the topic at hand. That's what it's just how it just concluded. The preparatory phase probably concluded a couple of months ago. And so that's the first phase, which takes about a year. And that's what he defined. He wanted one year of preparation. Vatican II actually had a couple of years of preparatory phase. About two years before was the preparatory. There was even a pre-preparatory phase. But the, the logic is the same. The second phase is what we're gonna do right now in October, celebrative phase, or celebratory phase, and it comes from the Italian celebrare, or celebrar un concilio, and that's where kind of we get the English uh, translation from, so it's the celebrated phase, or it's when you actually have the meeting. So they're gonna meet in Rome in October to discuss the topic, although they already have an idea what they're gonna, what they're gonna say, because they've already consulted the faithful uh, the year before. And then the last phase, so after the synod finishes, and it's, it's uh, uh, I think it's already uh, uh, anticipated the synod's not gonna last more than a month. And so by the end of October, uh, they will move to the third phase, which is implementation. Uh, in Italian, it's actualizzazione or actualizzazione in, uh, in, in Spanish. So la fase de actualizzazione, I think the closest thing in English we have is implementation. In, in the Vatican website, they say the actualization phase, but I don't think that sounds right. And so it's the implementation is what was going on. And so the conclusions of the synod may be approved, not necessarily, but may be approved by the Pope and promulgated to the church. And so whatever the Pope takes from it, he doesn't have to take the whole thing wholesale. He can take this or parts of that. He puts it together into an official document and then uh, communicates it to the universal church. So what we have now at the end of the first phase is called the working document. It's called the Instrumentum Laboris. And it was published as the conclusion of the preparatory phase. And it summarizes the topic, the leading positions on the topic, and recommended conclusions already, uh, or recommended courses of actions in response to the questions or the topic at hand. The, topic, the, the document will be debated in the second phase. And so it may be amended, parts may be canceled, or parts may be approved. And this is done through special commissions. So all the bishops that are gathered there are gonna be divided into separate commissions, dealing with whatever part, and the parts of the document relative to their 
area of competence or expertise, well, they eventually vote either to change, to accept, or to amend uh, uh, the document. And then at the end, they put the whole thing together, and then the whole body has to, has to deliberate and uh, approve or not approve it. Uh, the document. And that was the same, again, process done in Vatican II. The Pope, however, can make unilateral amendments or totally veto a commission's recommendations. So even if the commission or even if part of the Senate agrees we want this, the Pope can just ax it. He's, again, he has supreme authority in this case. The Pope also issues an official document at the end based on the conclusions of the city. It could be an apostolic exhortation. It could be um, sometimes even an encyclical might even come out of it. And so in some official way, the results of this are, con are, are, are registered and communicated. And question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I see there that in the preparatory phase, mm -hmm. there is consultation of the faithful. Yes. I would imagine that's what the general... Yeah, so like for example, with the Synod on the Youth, uh, about a year ahead, there was a questionnaire sent, and I remember I saw it here in the... Uh, in some of the parishes, and they put it out for young people to respond to certain questions or go to a website uh, uh, to respond to questions, and that was like kind of a metadata gathering. In other places, uh, maybe uh, they selected representatives from different parish, uh, young youth representatives, and they did it there. It's uh, like here, I think it was just go to a website and, and, and fill it out, so. My, my mm -hmm. question is actually, mm -hmm. Yes, and there is. Yes. Yes, and there is. There is. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's look at the instrumental laboris. This is the argument. This is what's going on in there. And so the, it's titled The Amazon New Paths for the Church and for an Integral Ecology. Now, I bet no one here was consulted about it because we don't live in the Amazon. And so, again, this is the local scope of the synod. The synod of the youth was, well, youth all around the world. So, of course, maybe youth around the world were consulted. And here, we weren't consulted because uh, we got nothing to do with the Amazon in a certain way. So it's only the bishops and the faithful, uh, the clergy, the church in the Amazon was the one consulted for this. Uh, and so that would, that, uh, that's why, in a certain way, we, we're a little bit distanced from it. It's called Amazon, the New Paths for the Church for an Integral Ecology, 58 pages, 8 chapters. So I read it twice. This is, I'll give you a quick summary of what's in there. Three parts. Part one is what they call a, topic of, a topographical introduction to the region. So it's kind of a little bit geography, tell you what to ex explain to a Roman audience, perhaps, what is this region, places that most people probably have never been to. And so what is unique about it? What makes it stand out? So there's a little bit of uh, geography in there, talking about the different water, the natural resources. Um, and uh, it goes into a little bit of uh, sociology, too, and says, you know, aside from all the natural resources, and I think we know the, uh, the Amazon River, the rainforests, and the animals, and all these things, and the air, the Amazonians, the people that live in the Amazon, are connected to nature in a way that's unlike most city dwellers. And so if anyone's ever been to Brazil, it's got one of the largest cities in the world, Sao Paulo. Um, and Rio is not that far behind. And so you do have this large contrast in that country between a highly urban or hyper-urbanized uh, uh, environment, and then you've got the Amazon, which is parts of it are, are pristine, are untouched, are virgin forests still. And so those who live in that region of the Amazon are connected to nature in a way that most of us sitting here are not. Second thing it mentions is that modern life, however, is damaging the connections that the people that live in the region have with nature. And so as cities grow bigger or new urbanizations enter the area of the rainforest, uh, economic development, economic incursion, deforestation, exploitation of the uh, resources, it's breaking that connection, this natural connection that the people have with nature that's unique. It's like, unlike any other place in the world. And so it, it's, it's affecting and damaging that, 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 uh, the, the relations with people there. And so the earth cries, it says, the people and the cry of the earth are a locus theologicus. God, and what is a locus theologicus? Literally means it's a theological place. It's a place of revelation. Locus theologicus in, um, in, in church speak, it's really used for two things. 
where do we know God is precisely revealing himself? Go to sacred scripture. That's a locus theologicus. Uh, in the tradition of the church, that's a locus theologicus. And so there's different places that God definitively is revealing himself and is continuing to reveal himself. We'll call that a theological place because there's something that we can take from there. And so in this, uh, in this introduction, it presents that the Amazon is a local th locus theologicus. God is revealing himself specifically in the Amazon and specifically in the land of the, of the Amazon, among the place in a, in, a, in a very specific way. And so development and modernization, the exploitation uh, and, and the economy, since they're changing the place and they're encouraging the place and they're damaging the nature, then they're also damaging God's revelation. <clears throat> they're blocking this area in a certain way. And so that's now the problem that's being presented in there. Because the place, well, you hear, you hear about the, the, the fires that's going on, the development, the deforestation. And so if this is a theological place and it's getting destroyed, that means God's revelation is getting blocked out somehow in this place. And that's a problem. The Amazonians are very diverse. They're diverse people. You have different tribes, different types of people that live there. Immigrants also have moved in there. In addition to the, uh, to the Indians, you have Indians that have been modernized, Indians who have not had any contact with modern people as well. And so people in the Amazon are very diverse and they need different ways of listening. They listen in different ways. They understand in different ways and of course they communicate with in different ways. And so we need to figure out how to communicate in a way that they can rather understand. Because as city dwellers, for example, the way we communicate, the way we live, well, maybe they can't relate to that. And so how do we bridge that gap between this diversity and kind of this other, uh, this other uh, way of living or this other experience. Another thing it mentions is that modern economic development, and, and it always mentions cities, it keeps on going back to the growth of cities and the growth of urban, uh, and urbanization, it says it's resistant to dialogue because uh, you can't really argue with it. It, it is, it, it's what's happening, it's coming out. And, and so because it seems to dominate it does not respect the Amazonian people or the land. And so as the cities grow or in new towns or, or in or a, 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 an area of the forest gets burned up or chopped down, well, you, you can't dialogue with that. You, there's, no, there's no possibility of dialoguing with the land in there. And so uh, economic development seems to be a problem. It seems to be a problem of uh, respect with the people and this locus the logic. Yes. Bueno, sí, hay, hay uh, han habido varias hay problemas que a veces se ignoran eh, y problemas no tanto que se ignoran por la autoridad competente del gobierno, pero otra gente simplemente o son ignorantes de la ley o no le importan eh, y creo que es el, el incendio que, que tiene el fuego que tiene ahora es por eso. Así que sí, sí hay leyes. There is a, let's get to that one at the end, because at, at the end I want to open it up to a little bit of debate in there, so, yeah. They were talking about the development that's happening in that space, not development. Around the world, no, no, they're, they're specific to the Amazon. Yeah. So we could take apart the Everglades, it's okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Where exactly was this going to be held? In It's going to be in Rome, in the Vatican. And so part two, so the first one was like this introduction to the region, and what makes the region so special? Why are we having a synod about that in the first place? That's basically what part one's telling us. Part two is giving us this theory of what we call integral ecology. 
And so this is a new, this is kind of a buzzword, this is kind of a new concept that's been introduced, integral ecology, and uh, pastoral questions that come from that. And so in part two, uh, I quote it, we develop as human beings on the basis of our relationships with ourselves, with others, and society in general, with the nature and with the environment, and even with God. And so that right there encapsulates what the theory of integral ecology is. It's an ecology of relationships, and just like the ecology kind of sees how things are related or interrelated and act with each other, well, it looks at humanity as being constituted on the basis of relate. We're human because we have relationships. We have relationships with ourselves, with others, and with the society, and that's what makes humanity, and with nature and the environment, and with God. So our humanity, our, 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 our being is basically relational, I gotta say that's not new, that's called personalism. And so there is actually a philosophy that's based on that, it's called personalism, and it's that, well, the fundamental relationship between two is it has to be um, un yo y un tú, not un usted, un tú, because there's that closeness. There's a closeness when I can say tú, but there's a distance when I say usted. And so that personal relationship has to be based on a tú, and that's the real relationship, and that's the relationship we have with God. God is not an usted, God is a tool. And so, well, that's a whole different story in there. But in a certain way, I said that this was personalism kind of being rehashed in a certain way uh, uh, with, a, with, a different, uh, with a different title. Amazonians have a unique relationship with the land. And so we said again, they have a way of relating to it that we can't from being in the city. And so, and with each other uh, through intergenerational, spiritual, cosmological connections. And so, by that means philosophicals, ways of living, ways of being, that they understand each other in a way that we can't because we're not from there. And so the destruction of the Amazon is equal, and this is what they present in there. The destruction of the Amazon is equivalent to a destruction of life and revelation. And so if this particular and unique life exists in this region, any attempt or any way you harm it is a way of killing it, and so you're killing a unique life. And if this place is a locus theologicus where God is revealing himself, then you're also destroying revelation at the same time by destroying the Amazon. And so the Amazon has to be saved, they continue. From, I quote, neo-colonial influence that does not respect the integral ecology of its native inhabitants. And so, Neocolonial influence, I, mean, I guess that has to be defined. It's not defined, but I guess we can draw our conclusions of what that means. I guess that modern influence or modern culture, modern society does not respect that unique connections they have in the, uh, in the jungle and the native inhabitants. And so we have to save it from that because it's destroying it. And so that they're saying that neocolonial is what kills the Amazon. There are isolated tribes in there that do not wish to have contact with modernity. They still are not in contact by modernity. And so the government must keep them in isolation, must respect that, must respect their isolation and take proactive measures to keep them isolated. Which one? Which one? With the, I assume it has to be the governments of the countries that are bordered there. So Brazil, Colombia, uh, uh, Peru. Um, just on a side, I mean, on one side, if you can't contact them, I don't know how you de actively defend them without contact, but uh, we'll discuss that later. How about, uh, <laughs> about evangelization of those people? That wasn't mentioned in, in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this chapter. And so the economic development and urbanization that forces Amaz people of the Amazon to leave because, well, poverty and so work and wealth is found in the city. It's not found in the jungle. Uh, so people leave, uh, breaks those relationships. So families get broken, generations get broken, and so those unique connections amongst the people at Amazon are getting broken because of the search for development and uh, the allure of the city and urbanization. And so the church should be paying special attention to migration outside of the Amazon and to urban planning in a way that respects the Amazon or does not encroach anymore. And so, uh, once again, economic development or modernization has been singled out. It's, it's a problem for this area. And so it mentions, and again I quote, an eco-theology 
or a Pan-American indigenous theology that grows and is particular to the region has to be respected, must be studied, and promulgated. And so future clergy that are going to serve in the Amazon should be trained in this particular type of theology. And it'll even, it even mentions that not theologies that are foreign to the area. That's what we learn in the seminaries here. But theologies that are proper to them because that's what's theirs and that's what speaks to them, that helps create those, uh, those unique relationships. And so there's an eco-theology that grows out of here or an, an indigenous theology particular to the Amazon that again is not addressed in Europe or North America. And so kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the a more controversial uh, uh, calling that it does is that the area or those there should abandon and reject modern developed culture because if it has a role in destroying the area, then there's nothing good about it. And so it destroys the integral ecological relationship at a macro level. And so this, if this is the cause and this is where it's coming, then it has to be rejected. And there, part two finishes in there. Part three gives us the conclusions and the suggested courses of action. This is the controversy. This is the controversial part, if the other parts have not been controversial yet. The, there's some conclusions in here that, yeah, this is, uh, we might be discussing. Others are not, nothing, there's nothing uh, new under the sun in there. And so, for example, the missionary face of the church must be changed and rethought in order to be effective in the region. Well, adapt to, be adapted to the region, it's called enculturation. Well, that's nothing new. That, 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 that's been going on since the 1500s. And so uh, the idea, though, that the face of the church as it is now, the way the church missions, is not enough, it's not sufficient, and it's not up to, the, uh, up to the task in the region. And so it calls for it to be changed. How does it change? By abandoning and rejecting the dominant culture, because that culture is associated with crime, oppression, and destruction, and death. And so the, the missionary face of the church cannot be identified with the dominant culture. What do you mean by dominant culture? It doesn't say it. And so we're led to believe, I would say, is the dominant culture, whether it be the Brazilian or the Colombian or the Peruvian culture, that seems to be the, the dominant or the governing culture there, should be rejected. And here's the one that gets me. This is, uh, is what I put in yellow. This is the more controversial in a sense, in an ecclesial sense. Sacramental expressions should be reconstituted in order to reflect Amazonian religious experience and not foreign religious experience. And so to change that missionary face, even this, the way the sacraments are expressed and confirmed, conferred should be rethought and redone. One example that was proposed in there was that instead of using the unleavened bread that we, are, uh, that we use for the host, that yuca be used because bread is not native to there. And so the Indians don't have bread. Bread is actually a foreign import. And so they cannot relate to the Eucharist the way we would with bread because they don't know what bread is. And so consecrate yuca instead of bread. And I suppose the same thing with wine because grapes are not from there either. That's very controversial because in not only in, in legally and canonically, but in the tradition of the universal church, it's bread and wine even where there is no bread and wine. You, got, you use bread and wine as, the, as a matter. The other thing, and this is the big one, it calls for the ordination of tribal elders to the priesthood. And so it recognizes that these are very remote places where most missionaries don't even get to, maybe if they get there once a year or very irregularly. And these communities basically live without uh, any ecclesial or official ecclesial presence. And so they're always waiting for the missionary to come by. And I kind of had that, real, uh, that, that experience in the Dominican Republic once when I went in for a Holy Week I went to this place called Fondo Grande, you can imagine it, and the mule took me. The mule knew how to get there, and when I said, how do I get there, and it's like, oh, the mule knows. And the mule knew. It went for 45 minutes and knew where to turn. It was a fork and then it went left. I go, is this? I let go, and the mule took me exactly to the town. <laughs> and it got me back, too. <laughs> so, and yeah, when I got there, I found out that yeah, the last time that there was somebody, I, mean, I was a novice at the time, to bring communion to them. It's like, oh, yeah, that was last year. And Padre came in and, and you know, gave us communion for Easter. And that was their Easter. 
I was, I, I, would, I led the Easter service, I wasn't ordained, I was just a novice at the time. And so these are very remote places, and so they suggest that the tribal elders, basically, since they are men that are trusted, they've had some sort of uh, rudimentary formation in the faith that they be uh, uh, ordained to the priesthood, even if they're married, even if they have families. Um, and that opens up a big can of worms in a certain sense. Now, it's not saying that priests get married, it's saying that the married men can be ordained, but not just any married men, the tribal elder, the chief, el cacique. That's the one who, who can be ordained with no special training at all. And in fact, it says only to give the sacraments in the same mass. They don't even preach. Actually, it says there that they shouldn't preach and wait for a missionary or another priest, uh, kind of a regular priest to come in, and he can preach or he can tell them what to preach. So they're just handing it. That's what we call in, in a historical thing, simplex, sacerdotus simplex, simple priest. Priest that does only says the mass, does not preach, only gives uh, certain sacraments, does not confess, because he has no studies. And so one debate or one uh, moment is that you can revive that, something that's been actually put to rest since, um, since the Council of Trent. That was the last time you had those. And it also calls for official ministries for women. Again, it doesn't define what official ministries are. Official in the science sense that they preside at a ministry. Official in the sense that they're ordained for the ministry. Official in the sense that, they're, that they've been designated by the church. Um, what do you mean by official ministries? Uh, there are many official ministries for women. Uh, which ones are we talking about? But it just calls that official ministries must be created for women. Um, which is a little bit ironic because in the paragraph after that, it mentions that women in these societies are usually put to the side. They have no leadership role, and that's part of their culture. So if we're talking about respecting the culture and all the connections and all that, then how do you say, okay, we got to also insert the women in it, despite that it's not part of their culture? Well, that's a debate point. And then the church should develop urban ministries, so city ministries directed at those migrants from this area and favor eco ecological issues, stances, and organizations, uh, pretty much wholesale. Whatever supports the environment and ecology, the church should be backing it, vocally backing it, publicly backing it. Uh, immediately. And of course, special ministries to those who have migrated from the area. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And so here's your, uh, your upcoming uh, synod organizers. This was basically the group that uh, was the preparatory phase that put it together. And so there are 18 members. There are lay people in there. There are women there. There are nuns. There are priests. There are bishops. And there's cardinals, two cardinals. And so uh, they're from all around the area. Uh, Cardinal Humes was uh, kind of very well known to Pope Francis, uh, Bishop Emeritus of Sao Paulo. He's the presiding uh, uh, or the organizer. He's kind of the boss of that phase. And Cardinal Peter Turkson, uh, the Dicastery of Integral Human Development is also there. He's kind of a power player. He's kind of an, a, a, a rising power player in there. And then the other ones are archbishops and bishops from different parts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the region. Not necessarily all of them. For example, you see there's an English one, Bishop Paul Richard Gallagher, Secretary of Relations for States. He's basically like the Secretary of State, even though there's, there is a Secretary of State, but he doesn't function the way ours does. Uh, but he's like the chief diplomat for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Holy See. He's there, um, Bishop of Asuncion. Basically, all the regions, all the countries that, uh, that contain the Amazonian area, uh, they're represented there with one or two uh, representatives. And if you go towards the end, uh, there we have uh, uh, Sister Maria Irene uh, de los Santos, who I think is uh, also Brazilian. And then there's a layman who I think was the secretary for the president of the CVX in Rome. And uh, he was named uh, as the secretary, executive secretary uh, for the, um, the, I think for the, the Conference of Bishops of the Amazon based in Ecuador. And he's functioning basically as the secretary for the, for the synod. So he's a layman. There is the one that's pictured in the center there. Thank mm -hmm. you.